see in your bulletins, you see the lesson for today. We're on discipline. The best discipline is self-discipline. And uh, this is part three of that. Uh, we do have visitors today. Um, two ladies I don't know anything about. They said Jesus brought them here. So if Jesus brings visitors, that's awesome. That's a good thing. Yeah, that, that's my kind of visitor. Yeah. And then uh, I have David and, I forget your name, Natasha. Natasha? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I should remember that. I'm sorry. Uh, and Natasha. And uh, they're here to visit us, and they were here for Sunday school, too. And it was awesome to have. Uh, David and I have uh, known each other a long, long, long time. <laughs> Way long time. And uh, we don't always see eye to eye politically, but we do biblically. <coughs> and that's the important thing. Yeah. And uh, Christians don't always have to agree about everything, right. but on the Bible, for sure. And so, uh, it's good to have David here with his wife. So, uh, self-discipline is the best discipline. Self-discipline strategies for a victorious life. And that's what we're talking about. Uh, what we mean by the best discipline is, if you do not discipline yourself, then you will be disciplined by God. And nobody wants that. Or you'll be disciplined by other authorities, like a boss. <laughs> The police. So it's better to discipline yourself than have any other discipline. Um, I remember when I was younger, and my mom used to say, "This is going to hurt you. I mean, hurt me more than it hurts you." And I used to say, "That's got to be a lie." And then I became a parent, and then I realized it is a lie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I did not like discipline at all, uh, and. and I was one of those kids that just did not like it. Um, I hated being told what to do. We talked about that this morning in Man Up. Uh, I'm a man and I do what I want. And I thought that way even as a kid. I do what I want. I remember one time my mom bought all these eggs. I think it was like 144 eggs. How many would that be? But it was for church and she was going to boil them and then color them. It was for Easter. Well, I decided that those would be cool for bombs outside in the yard. It was awesome. I got my sisters involved, and we would throw them, and, you know, eggs blow up. It was awesome until Mom found out. I did not like that discipline. And that's what we're talking about. Self-discipline. Control yourself. Make walls. Make rules in your life to keep you from having to be disciplined by others or by God. And these are different strategies. Again, some of these will come straight from Scripture, and, and those you have to listen to. Some of these will be my advice or, or my own thoughts, and you know what you can do with those. You can say, eh, okay, I see where he's coming from, but that's not what I want to do. Or you might say, I never thought of it that way. And that's fine. So whenever a preacher gives his advice, you can take it or leave it. But when it says, thus saith the Lord, you always have to take that. And so, we're talking about making walls. We read the verses early on where it says in Proverbs, a city without walls is the same thing as a person without discipline. And a city without walls are completely ran over all the time. Uh, so are you, if you don't build walls. And so we must have rules convictions, barriers in our lives to keep us from having to be disciplined by others or God. Let's read the introduction. When you place, where you place yourself and who you place yourself, uh, who place, you place yourself around can determine so much in your life. It will be, diff it will be the difference between a successful life and a life of continual failure. And so, what we're talking about is who you have around you and where you put yourself will tell us what kind of life you're going to end up having. If you constantly put yourself in a bar, you're not going to have a successful life. If you constantly have your people around you who are cussing and, 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 and vile, and tell dirty jokes, Thieves, 
drug addicts, you're not going to have a successful life. So it is important where we are and who's around us. And we must have boundaries. We must have rules. I know we live in a day and age where people say God doesn't get up, you know, caught up in the rules. We live in a day and age that wants no rules. And it's even in our churches. And that's not true. Again, I said before, I've had, I even had a woman tell me, I don't think God gets caught up in all the rules. And I said, did you ever read the Old Testament? Ask Israel if God got caught up in the rules. Do you think people make, where you work, and they make rules, you think they just make them and say, ah, keep them if you want. You know, they post 55 on the, on the roads as a speed limit, and that's just a suggestion, right? Yeah, <laughs> can be. God's the same way. You think he set up a rule and said, hey, you may want to keep that, whatever. It's just a little thing I slid under there. No. No. So we must discipline ourselves and take whatever measures we need to do so we can keep God's rules. I know people don't like that. I don't like when people say there's rules. There are rules. We have rules that we're to live by, and in doing so, we should make rules for our lives so we can keep those rules. That's what we're saying. And so, where you place yourself and who you have around you can determine what kind of life you'll have. Again, let's just look at it so simple. If you spend a, a lot of time in church that promotes righteousness, that's going to tend to a better life than if you spend a lot of time in a bar that promotes unrighteousness. It's just a simple fact of life. The following list is, a, is to assist you with the discipline of proper personal placement. Proper personal placement. Where I personally put myself and who I put myself with. This is a famous song. Um, this is the song that we press constantly in the addictions program. Psalm 1 1. Blessed, that's a, a, a fancy word with happy. You want to be happy in life? Now, when you're happy and it shows on your face and, and people see it, they say they're blessed. They have a blessed life. I want that. I want to be happy. I want people to look and say, that person has a blessed life. So, how do we get that? The Bible is very clear. Very clear. It doesn't mess around with this. Blessed or happy is the man. Don't get caught up on that word man. It means mankind. So it's everyone. Blessed is the man or mankind that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. You're happy if you be careful who gives you advice. We talked about this last week. Christians cannot have lost people as friends. I know that's going to make people upset, but it's true. Yes, we're, people will say, well, didn't Jesus eat with you know, publicans and sinners and drunkards? Yes, he did. In ministry. But his real friend were these 12 guys. That's who he spent most of his time with. And so when we say friends... Who do you spend most of your time with? Who do you get advice from? Lost people cannot give you spiritual advice. And I'll say it again. Everything for Christian, everything for the Christian is spiritual. Even to buy a car. Did you pray first? 
Have you talked to God about it? See how everything is spiritual? We got, a, we got married, Kay and I got married, and after we got married, um, that same day, uh, her daughter, it was a long story, but she lost the dog, and so I thought I'd be nice, and we'd get her a new puppy, and you know, we got there, and we were getting Kayla a puppy, and then this little black thing came up to me. And normally I don't do this, but I got emotional and attached to this little black puppy. I did not know it came straight from Satan. I did not know it. <laughs> and so I, they said, you can have two dogs for the price of one. I should have known then. I, I, I got that dog without thinking about it. I did it on emotion. It, it made me feel good. It's licking me. You know how puppies have that breath. And when we got it home, and Kay and I both agreed, that's the only thing so far that we've messed up on. The only decision. We'll do those things without asking God. We don't include Him in those things. That could really cause trouble in a family. Did you know that? A bad pet can cause trouble in a family. It can. This dog loves to tear things up. She could look at me and say, you brought that thing in here. It could. Everything for a Christian is spiritual. And if you constantly bring unspiritual people into your life, what kind of advice are they giving you? Happy is the man who does not listen to ungodly counsel, ungodly advice. But if they're my friend and they're my buddy, they're going to give me just that. Go out and be friendly, courteous with lost people. We want to win them to the Lord. Go out and minister to them under your terms. Don't go to where they are. You don't minister to people in the bar. But I can take them to White Castles. That might offend them. Uh, McDonald's. <laughs> I can have them in my home. But who I spend the majority of my time need to be godly people. Godly people. I can control that. I can discipline myself and say... Lost people are not my friend. They're not. They're not. They don't have your best spiritual interests at heart. They don't know it. And they never will. The Bible even says they're spiritually dead. They don't know spiritual things at all. And so all they can give you is ungodly advice. Happy. Blessed is the man. Let's say this. The man who makes a rule. I don't get advice from ungodly people. Happy is the man who does not stand in the way of sinners. I'm not getting close to them. I think I told the story last week about the guy. Okay, he got invited to go to the bar. He said, no, I can't. And they said, well, you can just go to the restaurant. This is what this is talking about. I want to tell you right now, this is going to make people upset too. Most Christians live right there. Most Christians live right there. What do you mean, Michael? Here's the world. Here's Christ. Here's unrighteousness. Here's righteousness. And I just want to get as close to it as I can but not really sin. Spend most of their time right there. Do you know what? What will happen? You're going to be miserable. The Bible says the double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You know why you're miserable? Because that pull to unrighteousness is completely opposite of who we are. Whenever we as Christians try to act like something we're not, we're miserable. But here we are, 
We want to be as close to it as we can. And what will be the pool? The unrighteousness. And like, just like him, as close as he could in the restaurant, he felt the pool to the bar and he's all the way over. He doesn't even go to church anymore. We need to set rules that keep us even away. The Bible says to be careful of the appearance of evil. We, we just want to stay as far away as we can from unrighteousness. Mike, what's the rules? That's between you and God. I have my own rules to try to keep me away from sin. I have them. But they're rules to try to keep me away. You don't want to live over there. You really want to be happy. Uh, be who you are. You're a Christian. And Christians promote righteousness. And Christians want to be righteous. That fancy word for doing right. I, when I went to college, I even told uh, Kay this yesterday. Uh, I never heard this term before I went to college. You know, they said, somebody came to me and says, you know what? You were a, a big fish in a little pond. And, I, and now, I'm what? A little fish in a big pond. And so, that's what happened. I went to college, and I was missed. In high school, I was the man. What did Michael think? Let's find out Michael. Michael, Michael, Michael. I was the man. I go to college, and nobody cared about what Michael thought. And so I began to try to dress like them. This was back when they had the whole preppy thing, uh, you know, with the alligator and the polo. You had to have that. And I remember one day, I wore a yellow shirt with a pink tie, and I tied a sweater around my neck, and I walked out, and I was like everybody else. I tried to be like them. Guess what? I'm a redneck from Seymour, Indiana. That wasn't who I was. And then by lunchtime, I went back to my dorm and I took it off and I threw that stuff away because that's not who I, I always, I felt miserable the whole time. Christians, quit trying to lean over to unrighteousness. You know, I'm not fallen yet. It's not who you are. And yes, you're miserable. And it shows on your face. It shows on your attitude. It shows when you come to church. It shows it outside of the church. It's just a miserable person. Because you're acting like something you're not. We are righteous. And we're to be righteous. And we try to do everything we can to stay in righteous. And not unrighteousness. You want to be happy? You want to be successful? I mean, I want to get through this first. I don't know. <laughs> don't stand. Don't get near unrighteousness. The last one. Nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. That is awful. That is awful. You begin to scorn who you are. Don't you? David, I'm not getting political, but <laughs> Don't you hate it when, pe when Americans tear down their own country? Yes. You're an American. Yes. Why do you do that? Yep. I hate it when somebody does it to my football team. I'm a Colts fan. I love the Colts. I'm sorry. <laughs> I love the Colts. I, I, I remember in Chicago, I used to, today they play the Bears. I can't, I hope, I keep telling Kay, I hope they win so I can rub it in the face of my Chicago friends. And I hate it when somebody, they're a Colts fan too, and they tear down my team. Why are you doing that? You're a Colts fan. Christians tearing down other Christians. That's what the world does. And there you are, sitting among them, tearing them up. I thought you were on my team. And there you sit in the seat of the scornful. And you scorn church. There are, there are people out there right now 
who used to go to church, they're at church all the time, and somebody didn't give them a bicycle, and they don't go anymore. The reason I said that, there's a story. I met a guy on visitation one time, I was talking to him, and he was telling me how he stopped going to church as a teenager. Wow. He goes, I still believe in God. I still love God. And you know how I, how that goes over with me. No, you don't. You don't go to church. But, and, and, and people out there who don't go to church and they tell me they still love God, they don't. They do not. Don't lie to me. You love yourself. And so, he says, what happened was, is he was doing this contest for church, and whoever wins got a new brand new bicycle. Well, he knows he won. He knows he won. But they gave it to someone else. And I haven't been back to church since. Really? And he spends the rest of his life scorning church. You want to know if his life is successful? You want to know if he is miserable or not? I guarantee you he is. You sit and you scorn and tear down other Christians. That's not what we're supposed to do. But did you see the progression? First it was counsel. They, this person who was not happy, who's not blessed, first of all, didn't have rules about who they allowed in their lives. They didn't have rules, barriers about who they get counsel from. And it was just easy to go all the way over here to where you're even tearing down church. Had a lady one time tell me, told me to get the H-E-L-L out of her church. Miserable, bitter old lady. That's what she was. Because she had let the world cancel, slip into her life. See, not everybody likes preaching. <laughs> One time a lady came by and we were shaking hands. That's back when we could. Yeah. <laughs> shaking hands and she goes, you can take the knife out of my back now. What are you talking about? And her husband said, what? And she goes, you told him all that. I had no clue what she was talking about. I guess whatever I was preaching on was right in her heart. And she swears, to this day I think she swears, that her husband told me all about it. Had no clue. But you do know who did? Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. People don't always like preaching. They don't always like the preacher. That's okay. Guess what I do? I just keep preaching. I just keep doing it. Nobody's going to stop you in ministry. Nobody. You didn't put me in it. God put me in ministry. We talked about that this morning, didn't we? He's the creator of the creation. He has a plan and a ministry for everyone. This is the ministry that God has given me, and I will do it. No man can take me out. God has ever done with me, he'll probably just send me home. The preacher's dream is to preach it, and it's happened a few times. One man got up, preached a sermon, sat down during the invitation. The invitation was over. They went to go talk to him. He died right there. That's every preacher's dream. We preach. And this is what I'm preaching. Be careful who you get advice from. Be careful who you're listening to. Be careful where you place yourself. Be careful who you have around you. Make rules. Have boundaries. This stuff's important. I want to be happy. I think you want to be happy. The Bible tells us clearly that's what brings happiness. You want to have a successful Christian life. You want to be successful in life. Be careful who you have around you and where you put yourself. Just a very good rule to have. It's biblical. 
I still got a few minutes. We'll go over this real quick. I promise. Sometimes my in, my uh, introductions are longer than the, the rest. Psalm one one. Read it, learn it, live it. Number seven. Involve yourself with wholesome activities. We're talking about where we place ourselves. We need to have things that are righteous and wholesome. Not unwholesome and unrighteous. There are activities that no Christian should find themselves doing. Did you hear me? No Christian should find themselves doing. None at all. We can name them off. You want to name them? Going to bars and getting drunk. Running around with married women. Doing drugs. Those are just easy. How about tearing down other Christians and gossip? You should never find yourself doing that. Ever. I have a strict rule. Somebody wants to gossip to me, I say, that's fine. Let's get a hold of that person. Let's tell them. That stopped it real fast. I was assistant pastor of a church. Nobody wants to go to the pastor. You know who they always want to go to? The assistant pastor. And they'll say, go tell the pastor. He listens to you. No, he did not. That guy didn't listen to anybody. Yeah, you guys are meeting soon. He, he'll be here in November. He was his own man. He didn't listen to me. But I got to where I made this rule. Somebody would come to me, and they want to complain, or they want to gossip. they say, hey, you know, and I'd say, well, let's call that person. You know why? People stopped coming to me. They stopped it. I ain't going to go gossip with him. He ain't gonna, he's going to call them. If you're not a part of the solution, or if you're not going to a person who can be a part of the solution, keep your mouth shut. It's none of your business. And we've got to learn even that to make rules. But we want to involve ourselves in wholesome activities. Unwholesome activities that are harmful to our physical Mental and moral health. They just are. Activities such as drinking alcohol, smoking cigarettes, smoking weed, recreational sex, uncontrolled mischief are examples of lack of self-discipline. Just doing whatever you feel like doing, whenever you feel like doing it, and who cares about the consequences. Matter of fact, you don't even think about the consequences. Those are unhealthy, uh, unwholesome activities. Discipline yourself to participate in activities that promote a wholesome lifestyle, like attending church, being in fellowship with other Christians, prayer meeting when the pastor calls for prayer meeting. Those are wholesome activities. The Bible says, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Everything that I do, the Bible says, should bring glory to God. And that should be your question. Before I go in here, before I allow this person into my life, does that person bring glory to God? Or are they going to bring unglory? Is this place that I'm going, does it bring glory to God or does it not? And set rules accordingly. Wholesome activities. Number eight. Avoid people who do not care about right or wrong. Avoid them. And we know who they are. We work with them. We see them. We hear them. If you worked in a factory, if you've ever worked in a factory, you know them completely. I had a guy one time at break <coughs> bragging about having sex with this woman who was not his wife. And, and she was married too. And I knew his wife. Well, he's bragging right in front of me. Ticked me off, and I went in and called him. Told him, hey, he's out here bragging about having sex with this other woman. There are people out there who do not care about right or wrong. They just don't. We've got to be careful to avoid them, not be around them. We've got to set rules of what kind of people I want in my life. It's 
It's terribly destructive spending time with unethical people. They are not cute. I put that on purpose. Everybody was laughing when he was bragging about, that's not cute. They're not cute. They're not funny. It's awful. Their behavior is not funny. They are toxic and can poison your life. They make terrible decisions that hurts everyone around them. And if you're around them, they hurt you. Make a point in your life to avoid harmful people. Harmful people. The Bible says in Proverbs 4, 14, Enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of the evil man. Avoid it. Don't go down that path. Don't laugh and giggle. It's not funny. It's not cute. One last, I think I even told this story once before. Don't worry, we'll be done in time. One time, I was at break in the factory, and, and the, this lady was telling a story how she went into the hotel room, and there were rose petals all over the floor, and on the bed, and candles, and, and music was playing, and there, all the women were like, ooh, ah. And they said, that is so romantic. Well, they went and asked me, don't ask me if you don't want my opinion, don't ask. They asked me, and they said, Michael, isn't that romantic? And I said, no, it's not romantic at all. They go, oh, you're just being a man. I said, no. They are not married to each other. Matter of fact, they're married to other people. How is that romantic? It's sin. It's evil. Did you know people stopped sitting with me at break time after that? Mm -hmm. That's okay. You know, I have found, when we talk about being trying to be separate from the world, if you stand for righteousness, you don't have to really worry much about separating from them. They'll separate from you. It's not cute. It's not funny. We stand for righteousness. And make sure that you don't enter into that path, even a little bit. I don't care if they call me a jerk. Don't throw it up in my face. It's evil. It's wicked. I was just going to sit there and mind my own business. You ask me a question, I answer. People say, you're being a jerk. You're I am not going to enter into that path. I'm not going to condone it. I'm not going to be a part of it. That's my rule. Where's yours? Where's yours? Don't enter into the path. Don't give in to wickedness. Avoid it. Then the last one. Avoid situations that you know will tempt you. This is the one that bothers me the most. Especially working with addicts. I had a guy one time. He says, Michael, can you pray for me? i got a, a, a job interview coming up. I said, oh yeah, I'll pray for you. Where is it? Oh, at a bar. He wanted to be a bouncer at a bar. <laughs> I said, no, I'm not going to pray for that. <laughs> I'm not. You're an alcoholic. Why are you going to a bar where you're going to be tempted? Guys, we need to avoid places that we know will tempt us. We do. There are some sins that we are super weak at. Don't go there. Well, everybody else can go. They, maybe they can, but you cannot. Don't go places where you know you're going to be tempted. Don't go places that are going to pull you more to unrighteousness than it will righteousness. And we know where those places are. I don't have to name them all. We have pastors that will go visit women for visitation on their own. How many think those always end well? No. You're a man. She's a woman. You don't think there won't be temptation? Come on. Make a rule. People make fun of our vice president because he has a rule. I won't go eat lunch with a woman that's not my wife unless my wife's with me. That's, right. that's his rule. To keep himself what? Away from temptation. Avoid it. Don't think you're strong enough. And those words will always come back to haunt you. 
I'm spiritual enough. I'm strong enough. Those will get you. That's like a challenge to the devil right away. You want to challenge him? Tell him how great and spiritual you are. He'll, he'll probably go to the God himself, because he did Job. Hey, this guy's bragging about how spiritual he is. Can I touch him? God said, yeah, give him a try. Take away everything he's got. <laughs> Take it all away. Make rules to try to stay away from things that tempt you. Whatever those rules are, to avoid temptation. Discipline yourself to avoid any possible situation. You know you will face temptation. You know your weaknesses. Keep yourself away from your weaknesses. Do not walk near it. Do not stand in the same area as it. Do not sit next to it. Psalm 1 1. Quit flirting with harmful behavior that controls you. And that, I said that earlier. That's exactly where most Christians live. They flirt with sin. They flirt with it. You flirt with it enough, they'll grab it. Your true happiness will depend on your ability to keep yourself from people, places, and things that are filled with temptation. And this is a constant battle. We need to be... But that's why the Bible says, watch, be sober, understand where you are, understand who you're with, be careful. Those are words the Bible uses. Psalm 1, 1, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. People, places, and things, we need to discipline ourselves about where we put ourselves and who we allow in our lives. And we need to make rules before God has to discipline us. And He will. And He will. I'd much rather discipline myself than put myself in the hands of an angry God. There's Bible verses in the Old Testament where it says, God's anger waxed hot. I have no clue what that is or what it means, but it doesn't sound good. I don't want God's anger's wax hot at me. I've had it. I've messed up. I've been disciplined by God. And if you're honest, so have you. And if you haven't, you need to get with God. Because the Bible says, those are His He will correct. It's better to discipline yourself first before God or others have to discipline you. What are your rules? What are your convictions about where you place yourself and who you place around you? It will come out in your life. It will make you miserable. It will make you life unsuccessful, especially your Christian life will be unsuccessful. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for your words what they mean to us, what they teach us. And Lord, it's so practical. That's why I love the Bible. It gets right to it. It tells us exactly what we need to do. And Lord, we just have to listen and try to practice. And Lord, I pray that there be anybody here today that needs to work on their rules of their personal life, where they put themselves personally, and who they have around them personally. And Lord, I pray that they work on this if they want to pray, they can come forward and we'll pray about it. Pray for all this in Jesus' name. Amen.